Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan. I'm your host, joined by my blue collar badass, Matt. Two weeks in a row, man. What are we doing? <laughs> it feels like a new thing. This is awesome. I'm loving it. We need to keep up this streak. It's way more fun talking to you than just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. Like I got a Lately, I've just turned on the Zoom recording so that I see myself whenever I record so that I'm at least, you know, looking at somebody, you know. <laughs> You're like, who is that handsome devil I'm talking to? <laughs> it's like, oh, shit, I need a haircut, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's, uh, good though. it's good to be back. Yeah, it is, man. Um, how's how's construction going in your world? It is good. We are going like gangbusters still. You know, we're kind of in that that end of the of the marathon sprint where it's a mad race to get things closed in before the the white shit starts flying um we had flurries here this week and it's just the weather's been just terrible if it's not flurries it's it's been raining and just brutally cold um but it's i mean it's good it's it's part of the par for the course we do it every year right it's just uh People ask all the time, like, how the hell do you build up there? How do you build so fast? And how do you get things done? And it's just what I, it's what we know. You know, if you don't get the windows in and the roof on before November, you're you're in a world of hurt. So we're we're racing to get things closed up. But as far as the market goes, man, it's it's reassuring, right? Like we are on the the pre-construction side, we're busier than ever. Um, I had a good call with one of my steel guys today and he was relaying some information he got from, from a new core call he sat in and new core who, you know, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, steel suppliers um, around in the country. Um, they're expecting a, a bit of a slowdown in, in Q4 and a, a bit of a slowdown in Q1, but a, keep in mind a bit to them is, is nothing. Um but after that, they see it all coming right back. There's still such a huge demand out there. There's no, the labor problem has not gotten any better. So in terms of, you know, work and, and future outlook, I, th- I think it it looks pretty good comparatively to uh, what we're hearing and what's going on in, in politics. Well, and I think, so it's important to note that, especially for Nucor, they're a publicly traded company. So he was listening to their earnings call. So when you listen to those, right, they've got to disclose anything that they see on their radar for investors. So there's a lot of other financial governance that goes around earnings calls. So when we talk about that, we have to understand that um, they have to disclose it. Disclose it. So if even if it's one two percent slowdown, they have to disclose that that's what their for or their orders for you know December January are which, or whatever it is, right? 5%, and they have to disclose that on their earnings call. And so for them, and remember, you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, when we talked about steel is, you know, Nucor is still probably trying to catch up to current orders. You know, they probably still have a massive backlog. So what they're talking about in slowdown is in earn or in orders coming in because people have to put deposits down. So that affects financials and cash flow probably for the next, you know, whatever, six months on their uh, backlog for um, Nucor. And we got to remember too, Nucor does some structural pieces. Uh, A lot of their stuff is tube steel, flat steel, pipe, um, and then they do other some dimensional steel. So uh, again, important to remember (laughs) what Nucor does, their backlog and from financial earnings calls. Um, I know you guys didn't come here to learn about finances and 10 Ks and quarterly earnings calls. But um, important to note when we talk about that type of stuff, um, same thing. If you look, look at like Jacobs or AECOM, you know, they're publicly traded companies. They have to disclose um, a lot of that stuff on their earnings calls. Yeah. And it's, it's just good. It's good info to know, right. It's good to keep up on that sort of thing. I mean, we, we track commodities constantly. You and I talk about it, you know, more than we probably should, but, it's it's good to have a pulse on these things because when you start looking at you know the dire forecast for the U.S. economy and and you start listening too much to you know the news channels and all the the pundits, 
you know, you're bound to go crazy if you believe even half of what they say. But if you get down to to actual what matters, and and that's in my world, in your world, you know, that's commodity grade steel. That's what drives most everything. And you know, when you see those guys not sweating, that it it's it's a little reassuring. Don't get me wrong. I think we're we're in for a bumpy ride um, for the next little while here, but we're getting our orders in for, for steel tonnage, uh, in Q1. I can promise you that. And that's just it. So, you know, for, for all you guys out there, it's important to follow the commodities market and then understand how like oil and stuff gets traded, right? When OPEC makes a announcement on production, even though it's not going to take effect for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever they, you know, decide or disclose that affects the market price today because they bake in future output into today's market price, which everyone always forgets that that's how a market gets set is based on future production or outlook, right? So if it's a bleak outlook, outlook right, a share price drops not on what today's uh, dollars are, right? If they uh, change their earnings call <clears throat> to where in the future they're going to do worse than the share price drops. Uh, of a given stock and then same on commodities market right if they foresee future prices going up then today's price increases along with that so really important to know like how the market actually moves and what the market uh, set is and then gas stations reflect future price today not what they bought gas for <laughs> right so like they bought you know whatever a tanker of gas say it's like 350 a gallon or whatever it is i'm just going to use this as an example so it's 350 a gallon is what they bought it for they're going to sell it for 360 right they don't have a ton of markup in their um deal or maybe 10 percent. so 385 is what they sell it for on price and then um but at the same time it, they could do it the other way right where the market dictates 385 but then um at the time that they bought it but you know in two weeks or whatever to get through that tanker uh prices dropped to you know 325 so now they're losing 25 cents on every gallon they sell uh for that so we have to remember like how this works in the real world i know this gets like real complicated real quick in um dealing with market adjusted prices but the, the they bought gas at a certain price and then they sell it based on the market and that fluctuates every day um at the pumps they got to mix the the high with the low and and come out somewhere in the middle, you know. It's yeah. It's really any retail does that. Right. And gas stations really don't make their money on gas. They make it on, you know, the soda, the Gatorade, the chips, Twinkies and the cigarettes. Cigarettes, <laughs> alcohol, like yeah. that's where they make their actual money. Um so important to to know those things guys. Um and again, I we're not really going to turn this show into a commodities talk show on uh, construction, but it's just it's a big factor in what goes into pricing from fuel to lumber to steel to everything else um, that we talk about and go through for construction. Um, again, as architects and engineers, I think we are so disconnected from price. Um, it's good to remember, you know, in kind of the guidance that we need to give our clients on these things, you know, do matter. Yeah. You know, I, I won't keep harping on it, but I had a call today, a sales call and it was my stereotypical why I love design build and it makes it so easy to sell because these this institution hired a local architecture firm, told them what they wanted, firm designed this pretty picture, they went and validated a budget and it was like three or four times what these people can afford. And they found me, uh, I was telling you before we recorded, they actually saw my sign of all things, which rarely ever happens. Uh, and they called and said, hey, how does this design build thing work? Can you fix this problem? And it's like, well, hell yes, you've come to the right place. Yeah, I mean, so often, like for architects, engineers, like everything's done on a square footage basis, and that square footage number is from ten years ago, um, not today dollars, and especially not you know day to day market pricing. So you know, it's such an old number on what you can actually build things for. Yeah, I mean, we we're doing estimates constantly. And that, that kind of ties in with what we wanted to talk about today. But we we are constantly doing conceptual-based estimates. And in order to do so effectively and to be, you know, be safe and not like throw away the, the farm, we're constantly updating our unit rates, constantly polling our our specialty contractors and and everyone to make sure that the numbers we're using are correct 
today because especially in this market the last two years man it's been it's been nuts to say the least trying to be competitive and and not lose your shirt you know it it all just kind of boils down to to who you know and and how organized and efficient you can keep things but you know the work that goes into putting in putting together an estimate on any level really is is pretty great and if we're going to put in that work and not have accurate data to back it up it's for nothing and you know that's where i think we're going to probably get into but it's just a it's a process yeah and i think the the thing that goes into it is um when we start talking about quality when we start talking about um actual production right actual construction in our case is and even somewhat on the design side is you know if you're gonna you set a price right and in some cases a client really doesn't want to pay for in some cases design <laughs> which okay uh fine but you're gonna get you know a, a lesser quality right quick fast cheap um, good, right? What do you want? You got you got to pick two. So, in a lot of this, you know, they want it fast, they want it good, and they want it cheap. Well, that's not a recipe for success. Somebody's going to shortcut something somewhere, and often it's in quality. And so, on the quality piece, we need to make sure that in design, like there's certain things that have to be upheld, right? There's certain codes, certain standards, certain information that has to be relayed. And really in a project, there's a certain amount of setup that you're just not going to get away from, right? All the accounting setup, all the projects set up, the initial paperwork, all the time that goes into it. And there's going to be really a fixed fee, no matter what, just to start a project. And that goes for anybody, you know, contractors, architects, engineers, doesn't matter. And, from there, then it's on the rest of the quality of work. You know, what do you you need? There are minimums that have to be done both on the construction and the, the design side. And I think that sometimes, and this again goes to a lot of us in educating the client. You know, I think more and more that I am in this industry, that we talk about this, that I hear from other architects and engineers now that I speak to a lot more of them than um, you know, when I was just in one firm and my own experience, I have, you know, again, I'm in a kind of a neutral seat, if you will, um, and I'm not threatening anybody. And so they feel like they can talk to me is you hear everybody go through these same type of issues. And it's, it really comes down to more and more that I see it is client education and making sure that the client understands what they're getting, right? A lot of our clients are not you know, based on the ins and outs of construction, contracts, how things are done. I've had one in all my experience that was on top of it and really understood and knew the process. They were over, you know, $300 million a year budget for healthcare. <laughs> so when they've been in the industry for 25 years doing the exact same thing in capital projects, um, but that's like the only owner that I've ever had that really, really knew what they were doing. Um, ins and outs. Most people are, you know, first timer or even at, in higher education where they do a decent amount of construction. Um, you know, a lot of their stuff is in capital projects planning, not in capital projects execution. <laughs> um, and that's kind of where, you know, they, they know what they're doing and, but they don't do it every day versus somebody like in a healthcare setting where they're in charge of a whole healthcare system um, that was doing just a lot of work on a daily basis and you know, contract and construction issues, problems, you know, contract uh, sending. So I know it's a roundabout way of, of saying that we need to educate our clients, but um, I think that's really where a lot of this ends up starting. So on the design side of the table, if you go, especially if you go the, the old school way, right? Design, bid, build. When a client first approaches you with a concept or with a need or whatever it may be, um, at what point do you start applying fee to their, to your output? Like, does this happen on day one when you, I mean, I assume you go and meet with them first without sending them a bill, but at what point does the ticker start running and, and the, you know, the, the dollar value start going up? Um, so let's take, 
I mean, there's a few ways this can run, but let's take a school because those are typically like that's a pretty straightforward process. So school, you know, gets a bond. They go out for um, they go through the whole hiring process of an architect engineer. They have, let's say it's a $20 million project. And then um, they go through the whole interview process. And then uh, once they select their architect design team, then um, a contract gets set at whatever percentage fee that they agree upon, um, you know, five, six, seven, ten percent, whatever it is uh, that they decide upon. And then from there, you know, it's set that you're paying this much for a $20 million building for design. And then, um, which we'll get into this in a minute, but is uh, ad fees on like they want to add a wing or they found an extra $5 million, <clears throat> then, you know, contracts typically get renegotiated on that additional, you know, design for their additional wing or whatever. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but that's typically like how, so that's how a school project would go um, for like the healthcare projects that I was on. We pretty much had pre-negotiated fees. So like, this one, we had a master service agreement that we signed to like get into it. And then pretty much everything was pre-negotiated on fees for the project. And then they would give us, you know, whatever the budget was. And then we would, you know, basically invoice based on that. So we'd sign like a one page amendment to the, you know, deal. Um, and we were, it all flowed through the architect when we, cause we were the MEP firm. So then we would invoice the architect on whatever our portion of that was, and again, all that was pretty much pre-negotiated. Um, for other projects like a one-off, you know, entrepreneur designs a building, it'd be pretty much the same thing. Budget gets set, like how much do you have to spend on XYZ building, right? What are you looking for? We'll kind of tell you what, you know, ballpark we think it would be in. And then, you know, a percent fee gets applied to that, right? It's not dollars for hours, it's fee percentage on project, right? Five, six, seven percent, whatever it is of construction cost. But it gets pre-negotiated. So then any escalation, you know, because it's a lump or it's a yeah, lump sum fee of whatever, and then a payment schedule over the course of the project, right? SD, DD, uh, C D, C A, um, on a monthly basis would be like the billing schedule for a project. So that makes sense. Um, it's totally different than how we can operate, right? Um, especially doing what we do, and we're we're kind of you know tip of the spear uh, in the design build world. We get a lot of clients, a lot of prospects are that come to us, and they have no idea what to do. Period. They don't know what a building costs. They don't know the process. They don't know the design process. Um, some of them don't even know how much they can afford. You know, if we're being if we're being honest here, we get a lot of people who come to us kind of trying to figure that out. Um, but you know, there's this age old age old problem we have, and it stems from the residential industry of doing free estimates, right? And you see it on like all the all the replacement window companies, right? They'll come to your home and give you a free estimate, and they'll do free this and free that, and it's really just a a high pressure sales tactic is what you end up with, but a lot of that has kind of transferred and, and has always been held in the commercial world too. And people expect to get a free estimate. They expect us to go and do our thing and put a package together for no charge. Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting conundrum, right? And we, we've found some ways to approach it and we don't always, we don't always do it, right? We, we typically won't do free estimates on most projects unless there's a reason. So we set up, pre-construction agreements, which is in a roundabout way similar to the fee structure you just mentioned. And there's a there's a set uh, dollar value. And within that value, we're going to provide X, Y, and Z. And within that X, Y, and Z is, you know, a fully designed uh, building, uh, a budget, schedule, all that good stuff. And eight times out of 10, we have no issues getting those agreements signed. Um, and then they're, they're set up so that if the project fails, right? If it, if it reaches a point of no return, then I get to keep my, I get to make my, my designers whole. I keep a little bit for, you know, our estimating time. Anyone who puts 
puts some uh, skin into the project gets gets paid back and nobody makes a lot of money doing that but at least it's kind of an insurance policy and it's it's not often that that you see that out there i guess in in our world so I, i'm just curious kind of what your thoughts are on, on taking that approach and you know it it's not like i said it sounds kind of like what you do or what you do, were doing in the in design world but it's just a little different spin on it yeah. So, I mean, it's the difference in dealing, like we dealt primarily with institutions, right? Sure. We didn't deal with like, I mean, on occasion, so like only one firm that I was in, did we deal with, uh, we did anything for a buck kind of, uh, it was when I was in Louisville and we would, you know, take on, um, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses, you know, that had like one owner and, frankly, those projects ended up being, a. it was not what we were good at. Um, cause so we were a full service AE firm, structure, civil architecture, interiors, and those projects end up being more like the extension of the owner's home than like, let us design this for like commercial office space or, you know, corporate spaces, right. Schools, hospitals, offices, for corporations um versus like this is their new hq for whatever and that's just it's a different hand-holding exercise that if you're not in that world all the time becomes very like cumbersome uh and a lot of babying the client for lack of a better term but that's pretty much what it is so for us and dealing with institutions, it was all very straightforward. And then the, the old adage went, you know, the best project was the one that never got built because <laughs> we got paid. There was no change orders. There was no, you know, liability. There was no nothing, right? We got paid for design and it just never got built. So, and institutions are very good about like understating that whole gamut of what goes into it of like, you know, people have to stamp, seal, sign, you know, have liability in the whole thing. And again, it goes to like owner education of like when you're dealing with these uh, entrepreneurs or business owners to where like they have, this is their first building ever. They don't know a lick about construction. They don't know about timeframes. They think, you know, we can crack dirt tomorrow. Um, and, and, you know, they get very rudely awakened to, to this. And I've seen it like in our, uh, in Arte, like people do construction projects and like, you know, they're like, why does all this happen? And they get, you know, all flustered about it. It's like, dude, calm down first Two, I, you know, I'm going to come to the defense of the contractor and the engineer, like in that they were probably right. They probably did the right thing. And you just have no idea about like the speed of which these projects move, right? You need one person to come in and then the next and like, you know, what did you hold up? Did you not give them answers? Like, you know, for somebody that's never done construction, I'm going to fall to the defense of <laughs> architect and engineer because they've done this a time or two. So um, I think really it's in, in what you're going through uh, with those one-off uh, architects, engineers, it's to have that two, three hour meeting up front with them is like the advice that I would give in like, Hey, this is, this is how the process goes. Or, you know, you do some videos and like, this is how the process goes. This is how, you know, construction works. This is, you know, what needs to happen. Here's the, you know, permitting time, right. Like to, to get through all the permits and, you know, just be aware we could take six months to get them because, you know, the planning commissioners are a bunch of idiots and they don't know what the hell they're looking at. Like I'm doing right now with the city of Irvine where we did permits for stuff. And I just, I came into the project. And I'm just drawing it because I can, and it doesn't need to be signed and sealed, but like, you know, they, they argued with against occupancy rates for us. You know, they wanted to go assembly and like a retail type space. And it's like, this is not an assembly. This is in a strip mall. Do you understand like the ramifications of going from like office space to assembly space? Like, and, and I would need 200 bathrooms in this 3,500 square foot space, you know, to do that. And so like people just don't understand. And it's taken us, you know, again, six months to get through permitting, you know, or maybe a year at this point, because they don't know what they're looking at. And, 
and I think it's it's really sitting down with owners and walking them through like, look, this is how it goes. This is what you're paying for. These are the heartaches. And, you know, if you would like to do this on your own, please feel free. But this is what you pay us for is to handle these heartaches, these problems, these like, and just walk them through all these examples of like, you know, do you want to go to, you know, town council meetings in the middle of nowhere or drive three hours, you know, and do this six times? Like, no, you don't like you, you really don't want to do this. So that's what we do. This is how we handle it. We've done this a time or two. And if you would like to fill out paperwork for the next three months, please be my guest. Oh, do you know what they need? No. Have you ever read the international building code? What is that? I don't understand. Do you know what life safety codes are? No, I have no idea. Okay. Like that's what we're here for. And people just don't know, right? They think of their house and a builder and, you know, I want two bedrooms and two bathrooms and a, you know, jacuzzi tub. Okay. Got it. Right. <laughs> exactly yes they don't know what they don't know and you know it, it's our job to to educate them i think you kind of mentioned uh the video idea that we don't need to get into marketing but that is a hugely powerful tool that that we don't use enough but i think we could to kind of cut down on that education process where you know when we don't want to be there in person for three hours to explain you know, just the the very basics of what we do and how we can help to be able to put that into a video uh, and get it in front of a prospect, I think would be pretty, pretty powerful, not not in place of in person conversation by any means, but in addition to it, maybe a precursor to that meeting. Yeah, it's just framing all of it. And this, I mean, while we're on the topic of bitching about owners is because um, <laughs> this is this is what I think the biggest heartache you know, across architect and contractor ultimately is right. Design and construction is, is the owner, right? Either they're going to be a, a help or a hindrance. And I think for a lot of it is, you know, and then the owners don't help when they pit us against each other. And it's like, dude, we're both here to complete a project and we want what's best. I don't, I've never been on a, I've been on one job site where, you know, a contractor was actually, you know, a real hindrance and we would have thrown them off. We just didn't have anybody to replace them. So that's what we dealt with. But like, I've never really, you know, other than that one out of the hundreds of jobs that I've been on, have we had a contractor that was actually adversarial, right? Like most everything that we've been on, like everybody wanted what was in the best interest of the owner. They wanted to do good work. And then we get pitted against each other for, no good reason. Um, which again is why design build works is in the way that you're doing it is one contract holder, <laughs> one, right, right. one guy, and you know, you're owning both, both sides of it. And again, most design build worlds, um, that's not how they, they actually do them. It is, they run them design bid build, whether they say that or not, that's how I've always been on those design build projects. Um, so but in Good marketing slogan yeah i mean they just we'll get into that at another point um because it really irks me like that how they did it and then it screws up the contracts and you know we have no ramification against the um contractor in those cases of them screwing stuff up because we are contractually bound to them not to the owner so that's how that works um, but is in you know, really in doing this free shit, right. For people is, I think, you know, it doesn't, it extends more than, um, just design work. Right. And one, people don't value design. They really don't until like they know that they need it or they see what they get after it. And then there's, you're not going to redo the building. It's like, well, this design sucked. Let's tear it down and start again. It doesn't happen. You live with it and bitch about it for however long you're in that building or ever you know like <laughs> that's i think typically how it goes yes. so in that is you know really standing your ground on what you allow people to do for free and what they really need to pay for um throughout the entire process of construction yeah i mean we got to fight for for legitimately what's right and you gotta you gotta charge what you're worth 
and you need to be compensated for what you're doing. And that goes across the board from design to, to me, to my, my specialty contractors, everybody, everybody involved, you know, you don't, you don't go into a restaurant and order a, a fine meal. And then when the meal gets out, just decide you don't want to pay for it. Even though you haven't tried it yet. Right. It, it doesn't, it's just, it's foolish to even talk about that because it doesn't happen anywhere other than in the construction world. So what do you guys do on your side of the table for as far as late payments go? Because on my side, you know, luckily knock on wood, we don't deal with that very often. Uh, we have a client now that is consistently, consistently late. Um, and it causes a ruffle in the system, but you know, at the end of the day, as a builder, we have the ability to say, all right, F it, we're done and just stop you guys you know, not for most of it, I would assume your work's already done and then you're waiting to get the payment. Yeah. So that's like the, the problem with a lot of design is that we do it, then we get paid for it and then they have it, then there's no recourse on it. Um, I mean, you can ultimately do liens and stuff like that. Um, but we don't have like, we can't just stop construction and then everyone's like, Oh shit, let me get out my checkbook and you know, let's get this rolling again. Um, so there's not like that hard, painful recourse that we have. And, you know, ultimately, so through design, it, it can be a very big problem or, and, you know, depending on when it is right. If it's early enough, you can just not, you stop design and like, Hey, you haven't paid. We're not going to meet these next milestones. You're not going to get shit from us and until you pay. But frankly, a lot of architects and engineers are pussies and won't actually they won't stand up for them like they're they're it's a scarcity mindset they're afraid to stand up to the owner they're afraid to say no they're afraid that they're going to lose the client it's like a place of fear you know they've been beat down by every contractor by every owner and they're just like happy to get paid and do their job and frankly want to be left alone like that's how most everybody that I've dealt with operates They're They just want to do their job. They don't want any confrontation and they don't deal with it on a daily basis. Right. It's not being on a job site and you get made fun of, or, you know, chided for this, that, or the other thing. Right. You don't really grow tough skin because you're, you're head down in a project for months at a time where nobody really bothers you. And then every once in a while you have to deal with problems. So they haven't really grown tough skin to have these conversations with people and really like stand their ground on it. And they don't get taught how to have hard conversations with people without just, you know, losing their cool or getting emotional or whatever. Cause they, again, it's not done on a daily basis. So, you know, it's not that they're at fault. They, they don't deal with it. They don't get taught it. This isn't a course in school of, you know, how to grow some balls. Like that's not what you go through to like deal with this stuff in architecture. And frankly, the people in like on the architecture side who typically lead these things, you know, they're either a bulldog and nobody likes working with them or they're just a total pushover. And there's no nuance in those two things, right? We've all met the asshole architect or engineer, whoever. Um, and then we've all met the pushover guy. And then, you know, every once in a while you'll get a unicorn that can nuance that conversation of like, you know, Hey guys, you, you really haven't paid us. You know, we're not going to do any more work for you. It's been whatever, two, three months. Like you haven't ponied up for this or a lot of it goes through into construction. It's like, Hey, we're not going to answer. And then this is where we actually have teeth is like, we're not going to answer another RFI until you actually pay us. You know, we're not going to deal with any submittals. We're not going to deal with anything until you pay us. Um, and then construction gets held up, then you have, you know, teeth to everything, right? So um, it's nuanced in a lot of this stuff. Um, frankly, nobody really stands up for it, or it's not known by the team. They don't know how to handle it, right? They don't know how to put the project on hold internally, and then convey that correctly to the client. And then, you know, people got put on another project, your project now got put on the back burner, Again, like, because then nobody's going to have that conversation with the owner to be like, hey, because you didn't pay, your deadlines now got pushed two months. We're not going to keep them because we took people off of them because you didn't pay us. So you're to the back of the line. And then every project manager in the firm is like, well, my project's the most important. And it's like, well, you know, we need to have a 
priority order here of who's actually the most important client. And I know I'm going down like a really long list and a big diatribe here, but it, it's a big problem internally to these firms where like, you know, every project manager thinks that their project's the most important and it, it may or may not be to the firm and the firm needs to set these like standards, but it's, we just do it all and we figure it out and we try to, you know, minimize who gets pissed off when and which project manager I don't want to be pissed off. And then, you know, it, it just, it becomes a big internal problem that doesn't get related externally to like, Hey, cause you didn't pay. And cause this project went on hold cause you couldn't make decisions. Like that is not our problem, you know? And then because they don't have that conversation, most a &E firms just eat it and then, you know, still meet the deadlines anyway, because they didn't want to have a conversation to be like, hey, because you can't make decisions, that's not my problem. Um, again, most contractors are very good at that conversation of like more so than architects and engineers, I, you know, by and large. <laughs> for sure. There, there is definitely that that need for nuance, because the way I see it in, in, on our side of the table, you either have. The complete pushover who I've dealt with numerous times, you know, the guy who is just so, so uncomfortable being uncomfortable that he'll never stick up for himself or his, his company. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the complete and utter asshole cowboy who at the first sign of a disagreement or, or a, anything, it's uh, shut that shit down, pack up your tools, we're gone. And you got to have that, that middle ground, you know, you call it a unicorn. I, you got to have something so that you can you can play both sides of that coin because there's a there's a slippery slope right if if i shut down a job site it's not just like i can click a switch and turn that thing back on tomorrow it's it's a process and it's not fun for anyone involved especially us you know the owner sees it and the owner gets the oh shit you know construction's stopped but then we got to put all the pieces back together we got to you know wrangle back in the the earth worker or the carpenter or whoever and just like just like you said you know the designers are another project now my carpenters are you know two hours away building somebody else's shit and it, it there's no there's no good that comes out of that so pay your damn bills people that, that's really that the bottom line yeah yeah and just be proactive about it and communicate effectively with your owners you know you don't have to be a dick about it but you gotta at least let them know where you stand, what the ramifications are, what happens. And then you have to hold to your guns. Right. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of owners just call your bluff and then you cave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not comfortable. Right. And, and people have a really hard time being uncomfortable. It is to me, that sounds just foolish because I I've grown to actually like it. I'm I'm happy in that place where I I'm uncomfortable and it, it keeps me on edge and it keeps me sharp and you know that's that's when I perform my best is when I'm out of that comfort zone. It's when I'm in the comfort zone that I see myself getting you know fat, dumb, and happy and and lazy and not doing what I need to do. So I see both sides of it, but you know you just yeah. there, there's no good way around it. You know late late payments there's no good way to handle it. You know, and you can, we can assess late fees. That's fine and good, but it doesn't make enough money to make any difference. And really the only option is either you deal with it, you assess the late fee or you shut the job down and none of them are, none of them are fun. So uh, communication, you know, we, we relish on that, you know, on almost every episode of this show, we, we somehow touch on communication and being able to have direct to the point, rip the, effing band-aid off conversations but so few people are able to do that i wish it was a simple you know answer to it um it's not it's totally nuanced you've got to be firm direct but you know cordial in doing it raising your voice doesn't help and i think the other thing in a lot of this is picking up the phone right people don't have the the gumption to pick up the phone and have that direct conversation and call with you know decision makers on each side and people who can actually make the decision right it doesn't make sense to call a, a foreman or even a superintendent um 
you know, or whatever, right? You need to be, it, it's got to escalate up to people who can actually make that call, right? You're actually talking to the owner's rep. You're actually talking to the principal in charge of the design firm. You're actually talking to typically like either an account executive or the owner of the the general GC firm. Like those are the people that have to have this conversation. Um, so I know some of you are not in the position to, to do that. Um, but those are ultimately who has to have this conversation with people who can actually do something, who can actually implement change and then dictate that down through their organization with enough authority uh, to be taken seriously. And, uh, you know, it kind of sucks for some of you that are not in that position. I know I got frustrated when I, you know, saw it, but couldn't do anything about it. Um, but you just have to have that internal communication up the chain of, um, you know, this is what's going on. This is what needs to happen. And then they've got to make that call and then do it in email when they're calm and not pissed off and everything else. But that's the other thing is to, um, as one of the project managers I worked for years ago is uh, anything that you do not want to come back to you in court, <laughs> you have a phone call with, and then you put, you know, what you need to in writing um, to cover your ass. But Again, up front, you you have a phone call, you get out what you need to. Um, that again, you you don't want to come back in court at some point in the future. A uh, thousand percent agree, man. It's either it's either a phone call or an in-person conversation on anything controversial or bad. And uh in our office, it better happen within 24 hours of being notified of it, if not less than that. There, there's nothing good that comes from waiting. It festers like a like a bad wound and you just you know you you hit it right if if you're wanting to be the the boss man on a construction company or a or a design firm you better be ready to to take on those conversations or else you'll fail and, and you better be ready to you know you're the you're the last line of defense you're the one that's got to have the strongest backbone in everybody and, and you gotta you gotta fight uh, for everyone on down the line at your, your firm, your subcontractors, your, everybody on down, you know, relies on you at the top to handle this sort of shit that no one else wants to, but it's real easy to forget that too. So I would just, as a, as a word of, uh, encouragement with a little bit of warning to the, the young bucks out there, you know, wanting to, to run the show, it's not all sunshine and rainbows up at the top. You got to handle a lot of nasty shit that people don't want to deal with. And I think one of the things that I, you know, now looking back on my younger days was, you know, when things were a problem, I, I bitched about them internally and then maybe took them to my boss um, or, you know, another principal or whatever. And when it should have gotten to them sooner so that they could handle it, right. They could address it. And instead of me thinking that I, I talked about it, but I never talked about it to the right person. Um, and I think that's one of these pieces too, is, you know, make sure that, you know, bitching's one thing and getting it off your chest, you know, do that in a safe space. That's not going to come back to bite you. Um, but on the other side of that is when things are a problem is make sure that you are talking to somebody that can actually handle it. You know, whether that's, you know, a principal of the firm, um, on the design side, you know, an owner, a partner, an account executive, whatever that title might be in your construction firm. Or, you know, going to the owner's rep uh, to make sure that they can deal with that internally and whatever systems that they have to address uh, on their side. So it's, um, you know, you can bitch about it. Uh, we all bitch about a lot of things, but making sure that you actually address problems with the right people to get them resolved is um, something I wish I learned sooner. <laughs> and I'm going to add the caveat to that, though, to, to make damn sure they're appropriate problems to be bringing to that person and, and not things that could either be handled by yourself or at a lower level. I'm going to leave it right there before I get myself in trouble today. Yeah. I mean, totally like, right. Like solve what you can solve. But again, we're talking about like, I mean, the whole genesis of this is in payments and in late payments and people not paying their bills and you know what do you do next and if you find out about it or deal with the accounting department so like me as a project manager for uh given projects i dealt with accounting on all my projects and then i dealt with some of them or heard through them and like who has paid who hasn't paid 
And my boss, like the office manager or principal might not have heard about that, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know. But, you know, when there's a hundred projects going on in a firm, they're not aware of like everything across every project. So that's where like, okay, I cannot, you know, as a project manager deal with payment problems, right? I submit my payment issues or my uh, percent completes to accounting. I hear about it from accounting and then I have to go to someone else to now deal with like, Hey, what do we want to do here? Because these people haven't paid for six months, a year, you know, like how do we deal with this and who do I need to talk to? That's where we're talking about. Like I'm, I cannot deal as a project manager with those problems. Uh, and do that effectively. I, I could, I could have gone and told, the owner that, Hey, you haven't paid, but I'm not in a position of authority for the firm to make those type of financial decisions. Right. And then the firm might've wanted it to handle it a different way, or they've handled it differently historically than I would do it as a young project manager. So there is also a ton of nuance in this and make sure you handle the internal politics of when, especially when it comes to finances, you know, other things like you know, RFIs aren't issued or whatever, typically you're going to take care of that yourself, right? Change orders, like you take care of most of that, like on your projects yourself. So the genesis of this is like in payments and how you want to handle like these catastrophic problems of like not getting paid for the work you're doing. <laughs> Nobody wants to work for free. I think that's what we're going to title this show. Yeah, like what do you want me to, Put on your paycheck right <laughs> it's not in likes and pat on the backs and attaboys you know it's dollars yep. and cents that's that's what makes the world go wrong i think those are two big you know topics that we can uh we could stop for today on you know make sure you're getting paid you know make sure that you're sticking to your guns on what's free what's not um or no charge. It's a better way to phrase everything. It's a no charge, not free. Um, because again, what you do is provide value. And then at the end of the day, make sure that you do things that are of good quality of, you know, on time and are for, you know, a reasonable fee. So it's pretty simple. Sometimes you just got to grow a pair too and handle those problems. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> Right on, man. All right, guys. Um, any other closing thoughts you want to add today, Matt? Uh, I'm just going to keep harping on. Uh, guys, share the show. We, we're, we're growing. We're reaching more people with every every week we do this. We need your help to keep, keep that growth pattern going. Um, we're looking for guests to bring on to interview now that uh, hopefully Dylan and I are, are starting a streak here of it both of us being on mic at the same time, it, it's always cool to bring in a, a third or, or maybe even a fourth party to, to join the conversation. So if you want to come on the show or if you know someone, uh, we got a couple of good suggestions um, this week uh, uh, via LinkedIn. So we'll have some conversations coming up that we, uh, we think you guys will like and just keep sharing it and tune in. I echo that sentiment, guys. You know, again, if you have any uh, topics you want us to cover, anything that you want us to do. Again, being on different sides of the table from uh, construction, design, now being in software and a vendor um, and seeing and hearing from a lot of people um, across the industry, you know, we're, we're in positions to help you guys. And again, we're, we're not getting paid for this. We do it because we want to, and we enjoy providing solutions to the industry, you know, that we know and love. So again, guys, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, that's this episode of the Construction Corner Podcast.